that should be in place uh, when you start your osteoporosis clinic and uh, especially for evaluation of osteoporosis. So as Dr. Chitra has already mentioned, maybe just I'll add one or two slides on the introduction. So as we know that most of our population is aging and uh, we are going to have more and more aged people as time goes by. So definitely having such clinics is going to be uh, a great success in the future because all the comorbidities or problems that happen in the elderly are likely to be on the rise. Dr. Chitra pointed out the prevalence of osteoporosis is huge. The same data from India, this is from CMC Bello, and what we found was one in five women, postmenopausal women, and one, uh, I'm sorry, 50% of women, that's, you know, uh, one out of every two postmenopausal women that you see, and one in five men above the age of 50 or 60 years will have osteoporosis, and that is a huge prevalence. So how do we diagnose, or how do we go about establishing a diagnosis of osteoporosis in these patients? And the gold standard, so-called gold standard, is definitely the DEXA scan. But just before we go on to you know, looking at a DEXA scan in more detail, uh, let me show you that the availability of DEXA scans in the country is grossly dismal. I mean, the amount of DEXA scans that we should have, we just have about 300 to 350 scanners in the country. That's too less. And this is compounded by the fact that it is costly, inaccessible, and you know, sometimes there's uh, you know, patients in the villages, in the remote areas, where they just don't have access to these kind of scans. So just before I move on to DEXA scan, so I'd just like to show, are there any screening tools that we can use in the Indian population that can predict whether this patient would have osteoporosis or not? So, is there any way to screen for osteoporosis without a DEXA scan is the question. And let's start with a very simple clinical question and just looking at tooth loss, just history of tooth loss or clinical examination of tooth loss and whether that could predict osteoporosis. And what we found in one of our studies is that if a subject had uh, you know, more than three tooth teeth which are lost, the chances of having osteoporosis is 4.2 times. A very simple clinical Thing. You just ask the patient, did you lose any teeth? You just look at the teeth into the mouth and you see that you know, just three two, uh, teeth are lost and the chance of osteoporosis is 4.2 times. We looked at a lot of uh, you know, scores and a lot of uh, evaluation tools which are available. Uh, as you can see on the left side, there's, they're using all the simple parameters like you know, the age, weight, estrogen therapy, history of rheumatoid arthritis, all these risk factors that Dr. Chitra covered. These are readily available, they are rapid. They are expensive tools and there's so many tools. So we try to look at our Indian population, if these tools are going to hold good. And first we studied in women. We studied in about 2,300 postmenopausal women to try and see whether any of these tools uh, are useful in predicting osteoporosis, are they accurate and how well they perform. And what we found was that most of these tools are good, but if one score that you want to remember one screening tool that you want to remember for postmenopausal women, that is the SCORE. So what is SCORE? It is a simple tool. It has just very simple questions. Race, rheumatoid arthritis, yes or no. Fracture history, age, estrogen, weight. Or if, even if you don't want to go online, just use the formula and you will get an answer. And if the value is more than six, you have a moderate risk or high risk. And we found that it is validated in the Indian population. What about men? So that is performance of risk assessment tools in men and the two commonly used tools in men, these are again without DEXA, they're just looking at clinical factors. The two commonly used tools is OSTA and Morse and we again studied in men and what we found was again these tools performed well but if there was one tool that you need to remember for men for screening osteoporosis and if you don't have you know, good referral for a DEXA scan or if your patient cannot afford a DEXA scan right away and you want to screen and find out who's the highest person, then probably most. Again, very simple, just weight, age, issue, COPD. Again, the same cutoff of six and this has been shown in the Indian population that it is very useful. So, to summarize so far, osteoporosis is definitely going to be a big problem as our aging population is increasing. The screening tools uh, are available to pre-screen patients before you refer them to DEXA and the two school tools that you would like to remember for women, SCORE, and for men, you would like to do MORS. 
So, okay. so what are the investigations that you should have when you have your own osteoporosis clinic and you know, if you have a full list of investigations that you would like to have in your clinic, the list is a bit large. However, most of these investigations are important to rule out secondary osteoporosis. And if you're able to rule out secondary osteoporosis, it's important because many of these are very treatable. I will come back to more of it in my next presentation, but you have to have these investigations. And the most important, as I told before, is to check on density by DEXA scan, which is indeed the gold standard. The principle of using a DEXA to diagnose osteoporosis is simple. It's just basically using two energies of two different types of X-ray beams, one which passes through the soft tissue and the other which uh, reaches to the bone. And what is the difference in attenuation? And it gives you a value. So I go through you a group, go through this particular uh, it's an old PowerPoint, so you cannot go up, but I mean, this is a classical DEXA report that you would see. And the first thing that I would ever like to look in a DEXA report is just the age of the patient. That is the most important thing because looking at the age of the patient, will I know what score to look at? And if the age of the patient is between 50 to 75 years, the important score that I would look at is the T score. And if the age is less than 50, if I have a young patient or a very old patient, then I would like to look at the Z score. I'll come to that in a while, but there are other things that you need to look into this DEXA scan. And the other important thing is the menopausal age. Because as we know, as the age advances and as the menopausal age is more, the risk of osteoporosis is higher. So when do I look for a T-score? The first thing that I need to look in a DEXA scan is a age. And if the age of the patient is between 50 to 75 years, I'll be looking at the T-score. What exactly is T-score? It's just comparing the BMD value with a normal young individual. And if I know that standard deviation, and if it is less than minus 2.5, I know that this patient has osteoporosis. If the value is between minus 1 and minus 2.5, then I know it's osteopenia. And if it is more than minus 1, I know it's normal. However, if the patient is very young and or very old, then I would like to look at a Z-score. And then I don't use the terms osteoporosis and osteopenia in those patients. I use the term low bone mass. And if low bone mass is less than minus 2, uh, I mean, if the Z-score is less than minus 2, I would say it is a low bone mass. I come back to the report. So as I said, the first thing is age. Next thing is menopausal age. Based on the age, I know this patient is more than 50 years. So which score should I use? T-score, right. So I look at the T-score. The scan is done yesterday in our clinic. And when I look at the T-score, you know, the values are quite bad. They are less than minus 2.5. And so this patient has osteoporosis. This is basically diagnosed based on the BMD. As I mentioned to you before, T-score is just a standard deviation. When I compare this BMD value, which I've got for this patient, 0 0.574, to a normal young individual, and I see what is the standard deviation difference there, that's the score that I get. And if the T-score is less than minus 2.5, it is osteoporosis. If this patient was less than 50 years and was young, I would have used a Z-score, and a Z-score value less than minus 2, I would call it as low bone mass and not osteoporosis. Well, the indications of doing a DEXA scan, we've already looked at a lot of risk factors. However, any postmenopausal women more than the age of 65, I would like to point out here, these are Western guidelines. Uh, in the West, the average age of menopause is maybe around 52. In the Indian population, it's around 47. Probably our patients should have a DEXA scan more earlier, and that's what is based on some consensus guidelines from the Indian uh, scenario, but there's no evidence back there. Men who are more than 70 years, or if younger, they should have uh, one of these risk factors. Any patient with a history of fragility, fracture, or the medicines that we discussed, and the most important of them would be steroids, I'll come back to it in a while. So these are the classical indications of doing a bone under density scan. We also saw in the last lecture which are the common sites for attaining a fracture and that's why these are the sites where we measure the BMD commonly and there are plus and minus points there. We know that the lumbar spine is predominantly the trabecular bone, so the disorders which affect the trabecular bone are likely to alter the BMD in the lumbar spine. We also learned from the last lecture that the trabecular bone is more susceptible for osteoporosis and that's why the prevalence of vertebral fracture is much higher than the femoral neck fractures which is predominantly a cortical bone. It's very important to know that your DEXA technician is trained adequately 
And you don't change your DEXA technicians very often because there is enough evidence to say that if one DEXA technician does a DEXA scan for the same patient and the other DEXA technician does a scan at the same time for the same patient, the values will be different. So the training of the DEXA technician is very important. It's important that you don't keep changing them because the positioning, especially for the DEXA at the hip, where the position is so important uh, that it can change the values quite a bit. You should also be aware of certain false positives and certain false negatives. When you get a DEXA report, you are suspecting this patient to have severe osteoporosis because, you know, this patient has family history of osteoporosis, this patient is 10 years postmenopausal, this patient has used steroids, and then you see a value which is normal. You should take back and see whether any of these false positives are there. You know, especially in the elderly, IoT calcification, especially, you know, if anybody has had a recent CT scan, any kind of uh, vertebral fracture, it can be so much callus. And that's why it's always important to always do an X-ray of the spine before you actually go and look at the DEXA scan. Because if there is a compression fracture, if there's any metallic uh, problem, or if there's any calcification, that would give a falsely higher value. I'll show you some of these examples. Now this is an elderly lady, she's 70 years old, and I was expecting her to have severe osteoporosis. She has family history of osteoporosis. And when I look at her report, there is some minus 0.5, minus 2.3, but I see one very odd value here. A T-score of plus 6.4. That doesn't fit with the situation. And that's because there is a lot of velocity there, or there is some hyperostatic process going on there. And this made a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. This patient never knew that she had a breast lump. And it's just because there is one odd sclerotic portion there that picks up a diagnosis of breast cancer. So you have to be aware of what are the factors which can increase falsely the BMD and which are the factors which can reduce the BMD. They could be compression fractures, as can be seen in this slide. So these compression fractures itself could give a false positive elevation in the BMD. So there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages of DEXA scan, but as of today, the gold standard for diagnosis of osteoporosis, the more best non-invasive method is definitely the DEXA scan. And once we've diagnosed a patient to have osteoporosis, how frequently can we do a DEXA scan? Now, bone is not an organ which changes so fast. So DEXA scan should ideally be done within a gap of two years. There's some exceptions to it. Somebody who's, you know, on steroids or somebody who's, uh, you know, they're trying to assess the response to therapy, maybe one year or maybe one and a half years I may repeat. But on an average, I would not repeat a DEXA scan within two years because the least significant change that I need to see in a DEXA scan would take at least two years to happen to tell us any relevant clinical information. It's not only important to see an, a DEXA report, it's important to see which company has manufactured that DEXA report, what kind of database has been used in that DEXA report. Because as we see, the two main companies, Hologic and Luna, it's the most prevalent uh, you know, kind of DEXAs that we have in our country. There is a different normative data that is used in these companies. And so the same bone mineral density would give you a different T-score in a Hologic scan and a different T-score in a Lunar scan. So you cannot compare two DEXA scan T-score reports of two different companies. It has to be in the same company. So you send your patient to the same place every time. You cannot keep changing different companies. This is one of our studies that we looked at to try and look at whether the Indian database would help us pick up more fractures and more osteoporosis compared to the Caucasian database. As of now, if you buy a Hologic machine for a DEXA scan, that would be fitted with a Caucasian database from the main study. And what we found in the study is that somehow the Indian database does not work as well, and we would have missed 70 people who actually had hip fractures. Uh, subsequently if you use the database. So whatever Hologic database comes with the machine as of today is probably as good. So to summarize the second part of this presentation, DEXA scan remains the gold standard of diagnosing osteoporosis. I will look at a T-score if the age of the patient is between 50 to 75. I look at a Z-score if the patient is young or very old. And the treating physician has to be aware of all the false positives, all the false negatives of a DEXA scan before you interpret a report or initiate treatment. Moving on, what next? So I have, I have a patient, I have done the blood test, and I have done a DEXA scan, and I have got a patient with a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Is that enough? So what I allude to is what Dr. Chitra said in the first uh, presentation, talking about building. And this is what one of my professors uh, showed me. I mean, this is CMC building. 
and when I was a resident maybe 10 years ago, uh, what my professor told me in rounds, look Nitin, CMC building is like a boom. There would be constant destruction at one end, this is one far end of the building, and constant formation at the other end. And that's exactly what happens in a bone. But you, as a physician, should be able to find out why the bone is breaking. So, going back, so if this is a bone, it could be osteoporotic either because of more destruction or because of less formation. Both, both the things are going to make the bone weak. But when I am diagnosing osteoporosis, it's not probably enough to tell this patient is osteoporosis. You need to find out what is the cause and how do you do that? And there comes the role of bone turnover markers. So there are markers that you can check in the blood which will tell there is formation. There are markers which tell in the blood which tell there is more resorption. And I'll give you an example of this. But before that, we'll look into the treatments uh, in the next uh, presentation. But you know, when the bone resorption is more, so suppose somebody has osteoporosis, very high resorption markers. That is, the resorption is happening, then I'd like to use an anti-resorptive agent. But if a patient has very low resorption markers and the formation is the main problem, there's no point giving anti-resorptives in a bone in which there is no osteoplastic activity happening. What is the point in giving a treatment which will reduce the osteoplastic further? So that's why it's important to find out which is the mechanism. You can easily do it. It's very easy. It's very cost effective. You know, this is in CMC scan, uh, the cost of the scan, which is one of the cheapest in the country, 1,400. But when you compare it to the cost of one turner markers, it's 390 and 500. So the two important one turner markers that you need to remember amongst the so many mentioned. So one resorption marker, if you would like to remember, would be beta cross lapse or CTX. And one formation marker, if you'd like to remember, which is most validated, is P1NP. I'll show you a clinical example of how we use it. But we've uh, actually got normative ages now <coughs> in the Indian population uh, for these bone turner markers. The BTMs correlate very well. And as I mentioned to you earlier, that when I have a DEXA scan, I cannot do it for two years. If these BTMs change dynamically, they will tell us within six months whether your patient is responding well or not. This is one of the examples. This is a very rare complication of bisphosphonates, which we might listen in the next lecture. This is a 58 year old lady who was 10 years postmenopausal, presented with pain and restricted mobility of the right lower limb. This is extremely rare to develop an atypical fracture. This is a complication of using bisphosphonate. Uh, it's rather ironical. You're giving a treatment to actually reduce osteoporosis and this patient has osteo, I mean, uh, atypical fracture. You see the bones are really thick and that's basically because the bone metabolism is totally shut down. And when you look at the bone turnover markers, alkaline phosphate is also one of the formation markers. Normal value in this lab would be 90 to 130. And this patient has a very low alkaline phosphate, a very low CTX. The resorption marker is also low. But uh, the formation marker, that is the alkaline phosphate, is very, very low. And this is an indication of starting an anabolic agent. Because if the anabolism of the bone is low, you give an anabolic agent, it improves the anabolic state. And that so, the points that we remember from this section of the presentation, bone turner markers are also cost effective, dynamic, you can re repeat them frequently, sensitive and specific tools. And one bone formation marker, if you'd like to ask for, is P1NP, and one <coughs> resorption marker that you'd like to ask for is probably CTX. Coming to the last bit of this presentation, we've diagnosed osteoporosis, we have found out why this patient has osteoporosis. Why are you worried about? This was already mentioned in the last presentation that the mortality associated with vertebral fractures, no matter in the best of centers, even in the US, maybe as high as one in third, one in three patients with hip fractures die. It's very costly, <coughs> and there are a lot of other comorbidities associated with it. And then, why does a patient develop a fracture is not only dependent on the bone mass. This is another study that we did, and when we were trying to look at what are the factors which actually affect a hip fracture, that's the, that's the final complication that we are worried about. It's not only BMD, in addition to BMD there is a lot of other factors and sorry there's a slide which is missing here, but that was about the FRAX tool and FRAX is an online tool which you can use to predict fractures 
and you just have to enter, enter the information that is required, the common risk factors, that is the age, the years after menopause, whether the patient takes alcohol or not, whether there are rheumatoid factors or not, and then what you get out of it is a 10-year probability of having a hip fracture or 10-year probability of having any major osteoporotic fracture. And if the 10-year probability of having any major osteoporotic fracture is more than 10%, uh, or if the probability of having a 10-year hip uh, ten year probability of having a hip fracture is more than 3%, you would probably want to treat that patient with anti-osteoporotic therapy. You can also use VFA, which is a part of the DEXA scan, that is the vertebral flux assessment, to try and find out whether the patient has osteoporotic fractures or not. In this particular study, you don't even, you know, not only come to know how many fractures are there, but you also come to know uh, what is the type of fracture, what is the severity of fracture, it measures very accurately. And you know, we found out that about 64% of asymptomatic postmenopausal women actually have vertebral fractures. So, yeah, so how do we use, uh, yeah, so essentially I'll summarize here that apart from BMD assessment, fracture is actually multifactorial and therefore you need to have a more holistic view when you evaluate for osteoporosis and risk of fracture. And VFA is an adjunct which comes with the machine, it just needs to be utilized more often. So to summarize the whole presentation so far, osteoporosis is definitely an increasing problem. Simple screening tools are available, Some simple clinical tools, simple scoring tools, one score for women would be score and the score for men would be MORS. Dexa scan is the gold standard. We use a T-score for 50 to 75, Z-score in younger and older people, and the treating physician should be aware of the policies associated. BTMs are useful to try and find out what is the underlying pathogenesis that is going on. One bone formation marker if you were to do was P and NP, and if one resorption marker you were to do was fetal cross labs. And apart from BMD assessment, a multifactorial risk is important to, us to be assessed and this can be done using a FRAX and you can also use VFA which is a part of the DEXA scan to find out whether there is uh, a vertebral fracture which is present. So move on to Dr. Chitra's talk on treatment and then I come back with some special situations. There's a question also. Sure. The bone I'll answer that question. I have a slide on that and I will answer that question very efficiently in the next presentation. Yes, uh, to an extent as weight increases, BMD increases, but on the far end of the spectrum when we see morbidly obese people, because of the comorbidities like fat, liver, OSA and all this, the inflammation goes up and so at that point it comes down. I have a very good slide on that. Systems we often get uh, people with those small machines where they put in the feet and good. Very good question. Absolutely. So, yes, we get people with calcaneal ultrasound, which is very commonly used. We've actually done it. Right. So, we've just uh, completed a study in 5,000 postmenopausal women using calcaneal ultrasound in comparing it with Texas scan, and unfortunately, it is a very bad tool. 
What is the one which you hold like this in one more? That's your body position. Body composition. Not for not for body composition. Body composition. Can he use a bad thing? Not a very good one. Maybe it has its advantages of it being portable, cheap. You can take it to the villages, do it. But when you compare it, and this is unpublished data yet, but then maybe public. But whatever data is available from the West, it is out of India. West is equally valid. Rest we do using an Dexa scan, yes, no. the forearm. And so then does it give an idea? No, the ultrasound, yeah. no. it's not good. The same thing for the frax. The frax score is uh, positive for the, uh, to pick up the, uh, uh, the probability of having a disease frax. Is it necessary to do a Dexa scan or okay. put the patient so, directly on the Very good question. This is a slide which got missed. So there's a difference in thought in the US and in the UK. Now, UK is very conservative. They're trying to save the money of the government. So there, they do frax for any postmenopausal lady that comes in. If the frax is high, they don't do a DEXA scan at all. They start treatment right away. If the frax is low, they don't do a DEXA scan. They give no treatment. But if the frax is in between, that's when they measure BMD and that's when they treat. But we don't follow that. In the Indian scenario, it's more of the US based, wherein they do DEXA scan for all. If the DEXA scan is showing osteoporosis, you treat. If the DEXA scan is normal, you don't treat. And if it is osteopenia, that's when you do FLAX. And then if the FLAX is high like this, then you treat. So there's a difference in different, in different countries. Whatever the consensus statement from the Indian point is there, that we follow the US one. So you do FLAX ideally for a person who has osteopenia. And if it is showing a high risk, you treat, else you follow. You're going to cover the treatment next. Treatment in detail. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? It's, yeah, it's good to be as interactive as... So if I have a patient who's had an x-ray and there is already a fracture there, okay, a lumbar spine, so should I go ahead and do a DEXA or... Right, so somebody who's already had a fracture is enough evidence for you to tell that this patient has enough osteoporosis and warrants a treatment. So probably no, but to assess the severity of osteoporosis, I may do. To see the response to treatment, I may do. But not for diagnosis of students. And one more thing, like, uh, there are some sports, I mean people play, playing cricket, running, falling, they have a hip, hip fracture, young, 40s, in their 50s. Do we evaluate them for osteoporosis or we put them on treatment immediately or not? Because I have seen many patients like this. Yeah, I'll leave it to you to answer, but yeah, I think it depends on the trauma and how much you Because while running, they, uh, <coughs> there is a fall and hip that, fracture. That's significant running, but yes. if a cricket ball hits, which was a very hit hard hit. That would be a high impact fracture, but uh, it wouldn't be wrong to evaluate for secondary cause of osteoporosis. Yes. If there's something else uh, which could be worsening, the or increase is a risk for fracture. And now with the, with the autoimmune diseases coming up high, remember that I mean, we see so many patients yeah. at a young age. So uh, after starting steroid treatment, after three months, we do the exam or how? I will be covering secondary osteoporosis and steroid induced osteoporosis in the fourth line, sir. With the therapeutic aspect. If the patient is on pyoglitazone uh, or SGLT, yes. How early you are going to... I'm going to come to that. So diabetes and osteoporosis is also covered in the fourth lecture. And maybe one last question, sir, second row. What equipments are required to start a osteoporosis? So, as I mentioned, the blood investigations yeah. I showed, and the only other equipment would be Texas. It is costly, 1.5 crore, and that's why... <laughs> sure. But uh, if you're in, in cities, most cities have... At least a few places with uh, yeah, so you might need to probably visit and understand you can change the laptop. You can probably visit and uh, make sure the DEXA technician is on the same page. He knows yeah. how to position your patient. Most of this uh, executive checkup uh, hospitals, yeah. they do this DEXA sign every year. Not yeah. right, not ethical, not right. You won't make a change. And if, even if you get a difference, it is not significant. Because what they say is the CD of doing a DEXA scan within two years, the chance of you getting a different report just by the fact of, uh, you know, the CD is so high that even if there's a real difference, you're not know. Is it necessary to monitor DEXA scan for the patient having osteoporosis? Or osteopenia. Response with under treatment yes. to measure the response. Response to treatment once in two years. It's good to know. Otherwise, you don't know whether your patient is responding or not. One more question. 
uh, you taught us about the interpretation of DEXA, but I wanted to learn the interpretation of 24 hours urine calcium phosphate bicarbonate chloride, which is there in your list. Sir. Absolutely. So maybe I'm sorry, cover, but cover I want to learn the interpretation of that. Sure. So maybe I can come back to that. Calcium is normal. Yes, we are happy to give back. You don't want to give it. It is another one. Once in one year. Once in one year. Yes. Once in one year. So actually, the assessment of bone density. He said that you have to do uh, after two years. Correct. So actually, this is the dose once in one year. So how can we decide the next year? We should give or not. So today we did the DEXA. We yes. decided to give. We give one zolentronic acid today. And then we give another one the following year, and then the third year before giving the zolentronic acid. So there is no, there is no need of uh, doing bone density second year. No, 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 no. You no. can use bone turner markers yeah. at six months and then back Okay, so should we just pause yeah, the we've questions already and go finished on to the, the time next session? Of the session. <laughs> But then, nevertheless, it's very interesting and very nice to have you know, so much interaction. Uh, so after hearing very lucidly about the treatment, uh, I thought we will cover a bit of uh, specific clinical situations wherein I'll be talking about secondary osteoporosis mainly. And also, we'll give you a very brief insight into the future of osteoporosis therapy because you know, if we are already blind as to what we're expecting to come in the market, especially for all of us who are trying to start osteoporosis clinic, the future is really exciting. So the initial part of the presentation also is on secondary osteoporosis. And we come across this term called primary and secondary right from early stages in our school life. We have a primary school and we have a secondary school. When we are you know, scientists or doctors, we have studies that we do, we have primary objectives in our studies, secondary objectives, primary investigators, secondary, and even apart from medicine, there are primary invest investors, primary stock market, secondary stock market. So this primary, secondary comes very often. But when, when we talk in medicine, primary means when the problem is either not known or it lies within the organ. And secondary means when the defect is outside the organ. And when we talk secondary osteoporosis, that is a heterogeneous group of disorders wherein the problem is either independent of age or independent of estrogen in use. So whenever there is independence of age or estrogen, and when we have another organ which is outside uh, estrogen, uh, another hormone outside estrogen, it is secondary osteoporosis. So why is it important? And the first thing is uh, to know how common it is. In your practice, if you have a postmenopausal woman walking in with osteoporosis that you've diagnosed, one in three would likely to be having secondary osteoporosis. If you have a premenopausal woman, 50% of them have secondary osteoporosis. And if you have a male osteoporotic, two out of three. So that's, that's the prevalence. It's much more common than we usually think, and secondary osteoporosis is common. It requires a high index of suspicion because you know, everybody can be easily labeled as postmenopausal osteoporosis, but until unless you find out, you won't really know. Until unless you know those causes, those common causes of secondary osteoporosis, you won't know. The good thing about it is, it is easy to confirm, given that panel of investigations that I showed earlier. And the best part is, it is potentially treatable. And we'll look at that in various examples, especially in a country like India. I'll give you this example. This patient walked into my OP a couple of weeks ago. And what she said, uh, she was very obese, she was very cushing oil to look at. And at one look I knew that you know, she's got this bone facies, she's got 400 blood sugars, she's got hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a report of osteoporosis sitting with her. And I knew she had Cushing syndrome for sure. But the moment I look at her cortisol report, the cortisol report is rock bottom, 0.4. So I'm very sure this is exogenous Cushing. She's taking steroids from outside, and that's why she's got all these complications of steroids. I'm very sure. So I tell her, Okay, so tell me what all medicines are you taking? Are you taking steroids? No doctor, I don't go to any allopathic doctor. I'm not taking any Ayurvedic homeopathic medicine, nothing. I don't take any medicine. I'm quite perplexed. I'm quite sure of the clinical diagnosis of exogenous pushing, and I'm sure and confirmed it with a very low cortisol. And I don't know, and she is very sure that she's not taking any other medicine. Then finally I admit her, maybe I think of rare causes of cyclical pushings or something, and I just admit her in the ward, and it's just during rounds. I see this packet next to the table. This is a powder. She's from the northeastern part. In CMC, we get patients from all over the country, and especially from the northeast part. And she says, this kind of a packet, doctor, this is my friend told me. And believe me, you should give it to your patients. This is so effective. My knee pain has gone after using this powder. I just take one in the morning and one in the night. And I analyze this in my lab. 
and just takes up the sodium. So you have to be really like a detector, and it's so prevalent steroid use, and then it causes osteoporosis. If you want to look at the list of secondary osteoporosis, it's huge. I just want you to concentrate on some of the common causes. And the first and the most important is drugs, steroids being first, hypogonadism, alcohol, especially men, hyperparathyroidism we mentioned, hyperparathyroidism. So we discussed most of it. I'll show you some of these cases. And this is talking about glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. I don't want to bore you with this pathogenesis, uh, again, decrease osteoclast, increase osteoclast, again, the rank selectin comes into play. There are a lot of mechanisms. These are the older mechanisms. There are more new mechanisms in the last one year. We've got publications which say how steroids cause osteoporosis. It's at the end of the day, we know that they are bad. But as a clinician, what all I need to remember about steroid-induced osteoporosis, the first thing, that the impact is very early in treatment. Just three months use, and the patient develops a bone mineral density which is low. May not be by DEXA scan, but the inside of the bone architecture is starting to get disrupted. It depends on the dose. So a patient who's taking steroids for five years and a patient who's taking just for six months, the one who's taking for five years is more important. The dose is important. Somebody taking 20 milligrams of prednisolone versus five milligrams of prednisolone, obviously more the dose, more the osteoporosis. The rate of bone loss is maximum in the first year. And that's the crucial year. You cannot say that, you know, uh, it was just one year because that one year is the most crucial. 10% in the first year and there are only 2 to 3% every year. And about 20% of people on steroids actually land up with a physical fracture within the first year. So it's very important for us as clinicians to identify whether the patient is taking steroids or not. It predominantly affects the trabecular bone, so spine is likely to be affected. Rib fractures, aseptic or what, what they call this as the avascular necrosis of the femur is also there. That was also in a way in which it affects the bone. But the best part is, it is likely to be reversible. And that's the best part. This is a patient, a uh, male patient, 53 year old. And you see in just about six months time, 6% improvement in bone mineral density. And you know, so the of corticoid induced osteoporosis is reversible. And last but not the least, Therapeutically, when you are treating these patients with bisphosphonate, I mean, whatever options you have, bisphosphonate is not bad, but if you have an option, maybe terapeutic care is a little better in treating glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. I'd also like to mention that whenever you have a patient who is taking glucocorticoids, as a physician, no matter we are sitting in an osteoporosis clinic, we have to be a physician and we have to make sure that all the other comorbidities are equally assessed, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, electrolyte imbalance, teaching the patient about stress cover of steroids. All that is equally important because a patient suppose has a febrile infection and you know, you've stopped the steroids, the patient goes for a hypocortisolomic crisis, it may cost the patient his life. So as a physician, even though you're treating right now osteoporosis, please treat the other comorbidities associated with steroids because it's so common. The second common sec cause of secondary osteoporosis is hypogonadism, especially again in men, this is a case scenario, a 27 year old boy, so, so the two important things that you need to do is the least amount of steroids required. I know it's very difficult. Somebody who's taking 20 milligrams of prednisone to ask them to take 2.5, it will take a lot of time. Patients will not feel good about it. But you have to explain to the patient that you know you're having so much damage. It has to be a very gradual process. But the first point I would like to make is you give the least dose that is required, at least for blood pressure, sodium, all that is maintained. And the second important thing would be that you make sure that this patient uh, gets a proper evaluation of bone mineral density and, if need be, even treat osteoporosis. So yes, it is very long term. Sometimes we take questions maybe after I complete the first half of secondary osteoporosis. And this patient uh, is a young boy who's got associated low back pain, back pain and he has no other problems. He's lived a fairly normal life. It's very unfortunate that we see even at the age of 27, uh, somebody who's got hypogonadism. On examination, he has uh, hypogonadism, which is uh, quite, quite classical. Normal disc volume would be somewhere around 20 ml. And uh, he has these biochemical values. His testosterone is low. His FSH is low. And this patient has a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which is common. Uh, MRI is normal. This is normal osmic. Look at the bone mineral density. So what, what is the first thing that I do when I look at the bone mineral density? 
age. So, I mean, here this is an older scan. So, this was the date of birth is 93, and when you saw this patient, the age was actually 20 years. So, what score would I look at? Z score. And what would I call this patient to have osteoporosis or low bone mass if it is? Low bone mass if it is less than minus 2.1. Minus minus so, this patient has low bone mass. When we talk of mechanisms, again, I don't want to bore, with, bore you with so many mechanisms of how hypogonadism causes low bone mass. But basically, you know, when estrogen is not there, estrogen is important not only in women, but even in men. And when estrogen is not there, there is so much problem. And as a physician, it's important to know so many areas where, you know, you can target therapy. You know, we were talking yesterday about hormonal replacement therapy. If some of you attended that lecture. Uh, we spoke about denosumab have this phosphonates. Hypogonadism of any cause, and another common cause in our clinical practice would be using antipsychotics. Antipsychotics tend to increase the prolactin level, cause hypogonadism. Many times we get referred for patients who get develop galactoria or amenorrhea after using antipsychotics, and there again you get 50% of them actually have a subnormal PMP. The third cause or secondary uh, uh, osteoporosis is hyperparathyroidism. We already learned how continuous elevated PTH does cause problems. This is a 43 year old lady. She is presented with the classical symptoms of abdominal pain, abdominal moans, and she's got renal calculi. She's got bony pains. And uh, this is her biochemistry. Her calcium is elevated, phosphorus is low, PTH is very high, partly because she has primary hyperparathyroidism, partly because vitamin D is also low. That would have con contributed to it. A bone formation mark, alkaline phosphate is very high. The diagnosis is clear. This is a sitting graphy, a huge parathyroid adenoma sitting there. Ultrasound also confirms the same, and she had a winter parathyroid. And the point I want to make is you look at the rapidity of you know, cure. So it's very important in your clinical practice to identify these small causes of secondary osteoporosis because you make a huge difference for that patient. Look at this PMD, which is done at diagnosis. Her age is Less than 50. Uh, look at the Z score. Minus 2.4. This is October 2012. She underwent surgery in November 2012. Let's look at six months. So very rarely, these are few indications where you do a Texas scan more often. In six months, look at the improvement. 23rd March 2013. Look at the BMD values per se. 0 0.6 at L1, 0 0.892. Just in six months. Remarkable improvement and so in one year. And so these are the serial BMDs. There's a remarkable improvement in BMD. There's normalization of character the patient is up and about. I've had patients who come on a stretcher with so many fractures and they come back after six months walking. And they're so delighted. And that's because you rule out these secondary causes of osteoporosis. It's much easier to treat and bone loss is often reversible. We're talking about chronic liver disease and GI disorders very briefly. Uh, chronic liver disease of any cause because Patients with CRD eat very less, they have very low albumin, they have a lot of nausea, they often receive glucocorticoids, especially autoimmune hepatitis, they have increased inflammatory markers, they have impaired absorption of calcium and vitamin D. Anyhow, our Indian diet is dietary calcium intake is so low, and on top of that, you know, they have poor absorption. The liver is important to produce IGF-1, insulin like growth factor type 1, which is important for the bone. It's an important uh, hormone, which is a second hormone for growth hormone to work on the bone and all these start getting affected in liver disease. And uh, so it's important. This is a recent study we just uh, completed it again. We saw in patients with hepatitis B, you know, a large proportion of our patients actually have osteoporosis. And uh, over here there's another cause when you use tenophobin that also induces uh, some bone loss. So double problems there. And what we found was both the lumbar spine and femoral neck Patients with hepatitis B had very low uh, GMD. And this was also in one of the other studies that we looked at uh, Wilson's disease, a very rare disease, but there again, any chronic disease, irrespective of the etiology, you would find a large proportion of patients to develop osteoporosis, which is significant. The predominant factors in these patients is lower IGF-1 if you measure it, short, I mean, lower BMI in this particular case because you know treatment of Wilson's is also the board. Talking about diabetes and obese individuals, there were questions about it after the first talk. So we know from data, which is quite sure, that a person with diabetes has a higher risk of hip fracture. And that is for sure. 
And why are they at higher risk? The risk is huge. There are a lot of factors. Both patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes have higher risk of fracture. And that's because of the neuropathy they develop, the complication of the diabetes, advanced glycogen strain products in type 1 diabetes, apart from that low BMI, low IGF-1, and insulin being an anabolic hormone. So all that is there. And somebody asked me a question about obesity and BMD. And what we normally expect is as BMI increases, there should be an increase in bone mineral density. But when they become very morbidly obese, and that's the time when they have OSA, fatty liver, you know, immobility, these are the patients who stay at home, they cannot walk around because they're so obese, they have knee pain, and then they have poor sunlight exposure. So do they have so normally we know that as BMD increases the BMD, as BMI increases, the BMD increases, but in the morbidly obese, again the chances of fracture is high. And the mortality of fracture is also much higher. Suppose you know a patient who weighs 120 kg develops a hip fracture. How on earth will it heal? Because whenever the patient will have weight bearing, there will be giving away of the processes. So increased BMI is also a problem. So how do you manage patients with diabetes and obesity with osteoporosis? What literature we have? <coughs> yes, lifestyle exercise that we learned, calcium and vitamin D we learned in the last lecture, definitely works good here as well. When you talk of anti-osteoporotic treatments, uh, drugs like allantonic work as good in patients with diabetes, the efficacy is as well. So you can use the same kind of treatments, but you need to be careful about the drugs that you use to manage diabetes in these patients. The two main class of drugs are thiazolidine diones and HGF inhibitors, <coughs> which you need to be cautious. So if I have a 60-year-old lady who's had a history of osteoporotic fracture, it may not be very wise to start fibers or so. It may not be very wise to start HGF inhibitors in that lady because she's already osteoporotic. These are the drugs which are shown to worsen the osteoporosis. So, so far, we know that secondary osteoporosis is common, especially more in men, about 50%. Glucocorticoid use and hypogonadism are two important causes that you need to know in practice for glucocorticoid use. The example that I told you, it is important to be like a detective to try and find out from where the patient is actually getting steroids. They won't come out up front. There will be Ayurvedic drugs, homeopathic drugs, off-label drugs, syrups, wherever, whatnot. And identification of uh, these causes and their treatment is uh, very gratifying because it is often reversible. So any questions so far? Before I move on to the insight of future of osteoporosis therapy, anything else that you'd like to ask? Treatment of hypothyroidism, removal of adenoma, and giving calcium, vitamin D, or? Yeah, calcium is already high. Removal of adenoma is the first line of treatment if you identify the adenoma. Sometimes, rarely, practice we find you know, there's no sensitivity or there's discordance and CT also doesn't pick it up. Uh, we use medical management like Senacalcin. Vitamin D if it is less has to be treated. But, but calcium has to be monitored. Otherwise nothing is required. Only removal of that. That's just remarkable. But for you to identify that this is hyperparad. You know many times I see in practice I, I will say over the last five years in CMC in our department we Three patients have died with hypercalcemia, which was not diagnosed by an outside treating physician. They just thought this patient has come with bony pains and has been loaded with vitamin D without checking calcium. And these patients presented to us with calcium of 15 and 17. And hypercalcemia has a huge mortality. Despite doing dialysis, doing the best of treatment, hypercalcemia has a huge mortality. So my suggestion would be, if you want to give vitamin D to anybody, please take at least a calcium. Vitamin D is a difficult test, but if calcium is normal, and you know that 70% of your population is deficient, you can still use vitamin D. But if you have not checked calcium, prescribing vitamin D can be life-threatening in the very small subset of patients who may have hyperparathyroidism. So which calcium is important? Ionic calcium or serum calcium? Both. I mean, if somebody who has got a normal albumin, both would call it as well. I want to talk about steroid backup program in those patients who are how to take steroids. Yes. So we have a backup program to tackle the side effects. Yes. Selection of alendonate versus teripetrite in early in, uh, cases of such patients. What do you would suggest? Is there any guidelines yes. for this? No guidelines. Or normally we start with our calcium, vitamin D and alendonates and then think of teripetrite. Whether the early introduction in the steroid patients. So there is one study which has compared this phosphate yeah. alendonate with teripetrite. They followed up patients for three years. What they found is that teriparatide, the bone recovery is better, but... Early introduction. Yes, first three years. No, I mean the starting from start. Selection of the uh, agents mm -hmm. or anti-osteoporotic agents. 
in a steroid uh, backup program. Steroid, really? you, as you're initiating steroids, yeah, I mean, you, you, you are starting a steroid and you know that it would be first and then you are I will go back to the basic <coughs> thought that you know it would not work as well if a patient who is receiving teriparatide today has passed through using bisphosphonate, it would be less effective. I said that's what I would no, Any say. parameter or guideline like straight away will be starting on Terry or you will be going for allergy. So. By my practice, most what patients will get alimentate because of the cost and non using of injection. But if the patient is affordable, teriparatide. <laughs> yes. is if we are starting steroids, then what should we As a preventive measure. It's good to make sure you assess the baseline calcium, vitamin D, treat it. <coughs> yes. Show the patient about. It is going to go down. Yes, it will go. So, so as a preventive measure, what should we start? So I would start them right away at the first. Day, I know it will go down. I monitor. I make sure the calcium, vitamin D diet, exercise is to the max, uh, best treated. And then when there is osteoporosis, as we see, there's one point I'd like to make: the DEXA scan is not the best measure to measure, you know, uh, osteoporosis in people with steroids. So if it's going to be more than three months, then I probably after three months start. But as such, we are deficient in vitamin D. I think there's no harm in starting vitamin D. Absolutely. Yes. Vitamin D, no yes. One, what, how long that in such cases, like you are initiated with your teripet, right? Then the duration. So where do we need to stop? Again, for bisphosphonates? No, for teripet. But for bisphosphonates, after three years, I reassess. And then, on an average, five years, but I've had patients have given longer as well. So you will be giving three years, five years, catch catch teripet. So you one so once you started on a steroid, say a chronic uh, steroid patient, you will be taking steroids, right? And then you are now prepared for him to take steroids. How long you will continue? Eighteen months. I cannot do it for more than eighteen months. So teripartite, the cap is eighteen months. How long you? Can. Even after that, the steroid is coming. Your RA factor, RA factor positive. Yeah, this was for it. That's called. But we don't have an official guidelines or such sort of so thing beyond 18 months. There is an American College of Rheumatology recommendation on prophylactic use of bisphosphonates for patients who are receiving steroids. So there is, it's all uh, set, we are not uh, we are making this up. So it's, if the guidelines are present, if your patient is one who is going to receive steroids for a long time, teribandite followed by bisphosphonates, or if your patient, you are not sure or you have other reasons, bisphosphonate to continue. Sure. So, just talking about the new agents that we are likely to get in the market in the next uh, few days, we already spoke of teriparatide as one of the anabolic agents. Uh, but the problem with teriparatide, if you ask me, is the one main problem is it doesn't really improve the BMD at the tip so much as it does in the spine. And that's where the concept of PTHRP being used, and this is an abaloparatide, is a new molecule, which is the uh, being tried in postmenopausal women, and the advantage of this molecule when you compare it to teriparatide at hip, it is very, very efficient. Different doses, 20, 40, and 80 have been tried. It's not yet in the market, not yet approved by the FDA yet, but just an insight. So this is a molecule which would work more in the hip. Whenever I treat osteoporosis, the main fracture that I'm worried about is hip fracture because I said the mortality is high. So this is a good molecule with that angle. Somebody says that you only have a parathyroid gland which is secreting PTH, why you want to give PTH from outside? Why not stimulate that own parathyroid gland to produce parathyroid hormone in small impulses, not continuously? And that's where the role of uh, calcilytics come in. Uh, just before calcilytics, another problem with PTH is oral PTH. I mean, it is an injection, so is oral PTH an option? There's another study with that, uh, looking at oral PTH. And the effect of oral PTH is not as well, but definitely there is an impact and it improves the bone mineral density. Some people who are dead against injection and they don't want that much efficacy, but they still want an anabolic agent it may be of use. Coming to calcilytics, so that's like pulling the calcium sensing receptor which is there on the parathyroid. These calcilytics drugs will go and bind there and tell the parathyroid gland, look, there's deficiency of calcium, you produce PTH. And they'll be very short-acting drugs, so they'll work for very less time, so PTH will be produced for some time, and then stop. So it will work like an injection that we give, but it's using, making use of one's own parathyroid gland. The drug is Ronald Calvert. Uh, sufficiently tested, phase three at this point, and the impact is better than this alindronate, but not as good as teriparatide. 
different doses, better than albuterate, but not as good as albuterate. Well so it increases uh, the BMP in the spine, and uh, this thing. The next uh, drug that I'd like to tell is Romosuzumab. This is uh, based on WNT pathway. Uh, WNT pathway was way back described in 1982. Uh, basically, WNT pathway is uh, a pathway which is a very anabolic pathway. It's not only present in the bone. Whichever tissue it is present, it increases the maturation and growth. And there are some natural inhibitors to this pathway, and one of them is sclerostin. And sclerostin inhibitor is Romosuzumab. And believe me, this is by far the most potent anti osteoporotic treatment that science has seen so far. I mean, as this is a trial which was published in NTM maybe about three years ago, and uh, we compared teriperitide and bisphosphonate, uh, and the impact is huge. I mean, uh, with alitronate, we would have seen this uh, increase of 4.1%, with teriperitide 7%, what you see with teriperitide is 11%. Very, very potent drug. These are all mono, okay. are all mono agents you have to use along with the. No, they are not yet in the market. I'm just telling of the future. And probably such a potent agent wouldn't need anything else in the future. So just to summarize, there are several new anabolic agents that are likely to come to the market and they are likely to be more potent than existing drugs. So the future of anti osteoporotic treatment, the future of such clinics is huge in the days to come. So I'll stop here. We are happy to take questions. In the patient of Edison's should we give vitamin D and the calcium like Addison's disease is cortisol deficiency. The most important is to replace the cortisol, but there is a difference. Now, in a patient with Addison's disease who doesn't have any cortisol with it, what you're giving from outside is just a replacement dose. It's not over and above. What we're aiming to achieve is the same cortisol in normal health. So I go by BMD and other risk factors and all. We said in practice it's coming up in India, we just got the refugee ranges, they're cheaper. So it's our practice we use. Once in six months. Any formation marker is normal and only resolution then we entirely go filing. I do that. We do that. PTH approval in pediatric age. Very pediatric. Hypoparathyroidism post surgical replacement therapy with teripetrite. So, teripetrite PKH infusion has been tried. PKH continuous infusion has been tried. Hypoparathyroidism. Post surgical patient, post PDH infusion has been tried. Okay. Yeah. The question is uh, when you give a subcutaneous calcium in our patients is very, very less. So I just make sure that it's It's important because otherwise, why don't you? You don't have calcium to build the cell at the With bio and AGL Dito, how long we can use to prevent osteoporosis? More important than by reducing the calcium urea. Real fluid. Calcium is no. Some of them like amphoe is a good thing. Can I make sure that the record is allowed? So can I make by how long or what dose? How long should be there? You should come with thousand ml of milk. It's possible to break. So, but from pre-menopause, the patient is taking adequate. But when you do a dextra in them, after four years, three years. Have you got any data about DEXA software now in less than 18 years of age, which we are talking about three years back? Do we have? So, the parathyroid gland will feel that there is enough calcium, as if it is a calcium which is bound, but actually it's not a calcium, it's pulling the receptor and saying that calcium is The mechanism which is basically we have more results.